Okay, good afternoon, everybody, or good evening, um, and welcome to George Audubon and our virtual Swift Night Out. Um, things are starting to happen pretty quickly, so we're trying to speed this process along. I'm Dottie Head. I'm the Director of Membership, and we've got with us Adam Betchell, our Director of Conservation, Michelle Hamner, our Director of Development, Melanie Burr, who is our Director of Education, and our special guests, um, Stephen Ramsden with Sunlit Earth, and Laura Adams, owner of Brickworks Gallery. So let's start off, we're going to have Adam tell us a little bit about what we're seeing, but let's start off by having, um, by having Stephen share his screen to show you, and Stephen talk about where you are. Hey everybody, Factory Square Lofts, looking at the same place where we had a dismal failure last year for our event. The sky is absolutely full. In this view, you don't see much, but watch this. When I go in, look at that. Wow. There are thousands of them. They are swirling like a giant tornado and dumping down into the chimney right now. So I'm gonna let Adam tell you a little bit about this while I pan around and give you different views. And this is absolutely amazing, folks. You should be out here. Awesome. By the way, Thanks. I'm Stephen Ramsden. Hey, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. This is, this is fantastic. I think this is about as best as we could dream of without being there in person. Um, as Stephen mentioned, you can see this reverse smoke that's going on. It's one of my favorite descriptions of chimney swift behavior where they're actually pouring into the, uh, the chimney. Um, again, my name is Adam Beschel. I'm the conservation director, and we are looking at hundreds or thousands of chimney swifts. These birds are, of course, migrating southbound. So the chimney swift is the only swift species that we have in the eastern United States. They occur from Texas, Oklahoma, the Dakotas, and pretty much everywhere eastward and a little bit up into Canada. Um, you know, a lot of people say they look like flying cigars. So if you go out during the day or if you're smart and you go to this spot tomorrow and see Stephen's view, um, you'll see these little, you know, rounded grayish brown birds with long sickle wings that are flying so quickly and kind of tilting left and right so, so rapidly that it looks like their wings are almost flapping erratically or at different paces, which is, which is amazing. And hopefully when I'm done, you know, going on and on, you'll be able to hear the interesting like Twitter that these birds give. It's often easiest because they fly so high and they're so aerial to hear them before you actually see them. And then you can look up and you can find, you know, sometimes just a couple birds, or if you're lucky in the evening, hundreds or thousands, if the roosting spot is large enough, like the uh, loft chimney that we're looking at now. These birds historically probably were somewhat uncommon. Um, they nested and roosted in hollowed out trees and caves and any other kind of opening like that. And then when we started to develop and, and build homes in the United States, these birds took really well to man-made structures and undoubtedly had a population boom. But unfortunately now we're seeing a steep regression or recession of, of these birds due to multiple factors. One is lack of roosting and nesting habitat like these chimneys. You know, we're building less chimneys, we're capping old chimneys, we're using slicker material where these birds can't grab onto them. Um, on top of that, as many of us know, we're, we're experiencing a pretty massive insect loss uh, across the globe. And these birds are aerial insectivores. They eat nothing else but flying bugs. So those two main causes plus <clears throat> issues on their wintering grounds and just some gaps in their basic understanding um, are undoubtedly conservation concern for these birds. So they are listed as vulnerable and they are the species of conservation concern for us here at Georgia Audubon for last year and for this year. And they're really pouring in now at Stevens Chimney, which is great. Hey, let's, um, Adam, let's switch, let's, Stephen, let's have you stop sharing for a second and go to Melanie and see what she's seeing. Yeah, they're just starting to pour into the chimney here. I'm in downtown Decatur in the parking lot behind Greens Foods, and they've been circling. There's a few hundred here. They're just starting to uh, pour into the chimney. Hopefully you can hear them and see them. You can definitely hear them. So one thing you'll notice if you look at the birds coming down to Melanie's chimney, 
if it's a huge chimney, an old smokestack, the birds can just fly right in. And then once they're in the chimney, they can then approach and put their little teeny legs out to cling on. Melanie's chimney is a little bit smaller, so you can kind of notice the birds will change their flight at the last second and kind of stall. And then they're going to drop in butt first to be able to then cling onto the chimney. So swifts are in the, the order Apodiformes, which is the same grouping as hummingbirds. And it means that they're lacking legs. They have no feet. They're incapable of perching like a warbler or a cardinal or many of the songbirds. Um, so it's feet, and they can just cling on to the inside. And that's where they nest. That's where they sleep. These birds are strictly aerial. They do almost everything except for sit on their eggs and sleep in the air. Bathe, feed, drink water, mate. They're doing it all while flying. And that interesting behavior actually makes them pretty tricky to study because these birds are so aerial, they cover such ground, they never stop moving. It's hard to do, you know, color band studies and other research type projects, but they're so very cool. And, and when they get down to South America, which is where they spend their winters, there are other similar swift species like voxes and many that are found in South America. And so they're really difficult to study across their entire range, but just adds to their allure, uh, in my opinion. There, there have been some banding uh, work done on swifts, and the oldest known chimney swift was over 14 years old. Um, again, we don't know a lot of that, the information on that longevity and survivorship just because they're so hard to study, but they might be able to live for, for quite some time. Okay, let's, um, let's um, try to shift over to Laura now, to Rickworks Gallery, and see what she's seeing. Uh, Laura, we're going to need you to unmute. You're on mute. Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Okay. Well, so it's a different scene here at Brickworks Gallery. I'm just a couple blocks away from where Stephen is. And as of three days ago, we, we had thousands of them circling this chimney and roosting at night. Um, but they all left um, like two days ago. And we just noticed it. And you can see there, there are no swifts going in there. So I, I have some video that I've sent. Um, and I, I don't know if we're gonna share that tonight or not, but of the what was happening a couple weeks ago here, which was pretty exciting. We, we were experiencing record numbers, it looked like, of the swifts this year compared to previous years. Um, but um, so it, it is 2020 and things are, <laughs> happening um, that, that are unexpected and and our swifts this year seem to have left a month earlier than last year. So I'll, I'll chime in here Laura so they could be gone but what also is really cool about these birds is they I think they'll still be around the Atlanta area for the next month or so typically when it really snaps cold later in October they leave but they will kind of ebb and flow from certain roosting sites. Some will be better than others. It could peak earlier, it could peak later. So you're absolutely right, they could be gone. Or you could be getting another wave, hopefully, uh, before the fall's done. But it's really interesting because it seems like even for a consistent flock, let's say Laura had a bunch coming in at her gallery at Brickworks or over in Decatur, um, there's almost always some, some leaving, some coming. They don't travel as a tight flock. And so there's a lot of uh, changeover at any roosting site throughout the year. During the breeding season, so from April through August, uh, there might be a single pair nesting in one of these chimneys where Stephen's looking or where, where Laura's at. Um, a few unpaired birds might share the space with them, but they're not colonial nesters. Only you know one pair and maybe a couple bachelors or bachelorettes joining them. But this time of year, the breeding season's done, testosterone levels have dropped down, and everyone's willing to share their space. And it's also a, uh, for thermoregulation. So on a cold night, these birds can huddle up closer together and there's a strong relationship. The colder the night, of course, the tighter that they will sleep together. It warms up, they space out a little bit more in the chimney. So hopefully- This is a slow-mo video that Laura shot at her chimney a couple of weeks ago that I'm showing right now from her YouTube channel. That's fantastic. But yeah, hopefully hers aren't gone, but yeah, there's, there's all sorts of interesting behavior, these birds with their, with their southbound migration. And again, they might have come through early at her location, but it could just be uh, a different type of changeover we're experiencing 
Last night, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology um, forecasted a really heavy movement of birds over Atlanta. So it also makes sense that some of our birds probably took off. So I know we were looking at Laura and Stevens chimney just a day or two ago and they had lots of birds and there could be, you know, massive changeover compared to- I'm gonna go ahead and share the live here if that's all right guys. Yeah, you go ahead and share your live, Stephen. Okay. Cause they're all going in. Oh yeah. And that's a hair on the bottom right of the screen, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Adam. Sorry to interrupt, Laura and Adam. Oh, man, that's great. I'm glad you're sharing. <laughs> Another cool thing about the migration of these birds is it seems like the evidence supports that in the spring and in the fall, they take slightly different routes. And by that, in the springtime, they tend to stay over land. So as they come up through South America, they go through Central America, and most of them appear to hug the, the Mexican coast and then cut eastward and, and spread out throughout the eastern two-thirds of the U.S., in the fall, there's a lot of evidence that these birds do a trans-Gulf migration. So they're gonna go down to Dolphin Island, the, the Florida Panhandle, go down through Miami, and they're gonna fly across the Gulf uh, down to the Yucatan and Belize and parts of Central America before they head down. So they fly over the water in the fall, but not in the spring, uh, which is kind of interesting to have such different, um, you know, routes or, or at least in regards to flying over bodies of water like that. So that's a pretty cool thing that they do. It's, it's obvious, I would think, that these birds, again, are, they're so aerial that they eat flying insects. So beetles and mayflies and uh, things in the bee family, uh, mosquitoes, any, any sort of flying medium to small insect, these birds can take them down. It was great to hear Melanie's too. You could really hear that video game type noise that they make. Again, they're flying pretty high up. So that's normally the first time uh, that you'll detect them. And when I first started talking, we were saying how one of the threats that these birds are facing is the potential lack of these nesting and roosting sites like this great chimney, because we're just using less of them, we're capping them. And so here at Georgia Audubon, we've been working with partners across the metro area to construct artificial chimneys. And the hope is that the birds will use these and it provides them more locations to ensure that they're finding safe places during their journey. And I encourage you to go check them out. We have one at Piedmont Park, which was our first one a couple years ago now. Beautiful 20 plus foot tower. That's a nice sage green with a native plant garden. We just constructed another one up at uh, the town center near Kennesaw, which has a beautiful mural uh, on the side. And we've worked with many others at the Sam's Lake Bird um, Sanctuary down in Fayette County to Henderson Park uh, and many others. So this hey, is- Adam. Yes, please. A question has come in. Do, we, do any of the Georgia Audubon Towers have any action yet? So I will admit that our monitoring this year um, with everything else going on that was kind of crazy was not very good. So the, the, I can confirm the Piedmont Park Tower did not. Um, the Wrecking Barn and Sam's Lake Tower, I personally did not get to. And we, I don't know if we had anyone. Maybe Michelle Hamner, our development director, made it out. So no confirmation, but part of that was just the craziness that has been this summer. We have not been um, doing a good job looking, and, and that. And and <laughs> yeah. how many birds? How many birds do you think would fit in that Ford factory loft chimney? Geez, that might be a better question. I mean, I don't know if Stephen would know either, but I would assume. Um, that yeah, I would have to be exaggerating a little. Probably, I tend to overestimate, but there's easily thousands of birds in here last week, and there's. Listen, I wish you were here because the sky is absolutely full of these birds still. And they have been swirling counterclockwise like this since uh, 727. That's 30 minutes ago. And Hey, Stephen, do they circle around the chimney multiple times before they go in? Yes, and it seems like one or two drop in every time, like maybe they're jockeying for senior position or something. But, you know, Adam, this entire group of birds uh, in mass just went uh, west all the way to the other side of the parking lot and then they all came back again and it was a really incredible thing to see and earlier before we started the broadcast we watched a great blue heron fly through the middle of this swarm coming from piedmont park lake probably going over to fourth ward and several of the of the chimney shift swifts chased the great blue heron away it was really weird to see and i i hate to interrupt but it's just it's just such an incredible sight i wish you were out here watching it because none of these camera views do any justice to it and i'm sure laura and uh melanie would agree 
Well, last year we were able to host in person Swift Night Outs and we hope to do that again next year, but COVID had other plans for us for 2020. Laura, do you have anything going? I see you looking back at your chimney. You're on mute. Sorry. Um, there are absolutely no birds in my chimney, which is so unusual because we've, we've owned this property seven years now and um, we've always had thousands of birds um, all the way up until October, mid-October. And this is the first time we haven't seen any birds um, stay in the chimney. So I think they're all at Stephen's chimney. <laughs> in fact, I think it was a year ago tonight that we did the Swift Night Out at the gallery. So. Yeah. Yeah. And we had quite a few, but it's got a lot colder quicker this year. Adam, does that have any bearing? Does the weather have any bearing? It, it does for sure. I mean, so uh, there could be an effect on the, the relative minor movement of birds, you know, either across Georgia or, you know, whether or not birds are coming down and going north. You know, normally a cold front, as long as it's not too extreme, is going to push those northern birds down. So it's kind of impossible to say whether these birds that we're looking at in Stephen's chimney you know, they're undoubtedly a mix probably of some Georgia birds and a lot of northern birds moving south. And so little cold fronts are going to be good because they're going to give them that push. But cold fronts are also going to diminish the number of insects that are going to be flying. So as it gets really cold, um, and again, normally late October is when the swifts really 100% clear out of our area, we get that first big cold snap and they're going to be gone in the blink of an eye. So there, there's going to be ebbs and flows. The cold front might push them in. Winds out of the south might keep them there because why fly into a headwind? There's no real rush for the Swifts to get to their wintering ground. As long as they have insects and it's not too cold, they'll keep going. Uh, in the spring, they're in a hurry to get up there in May, so they move a lot faster. But in the, in the fall, it can be a bit more of a leisurely experience. And just like Adam, just while Adam was talking, my entire cloud disappeared. They, they have all dumped it into the chimney and it was just a few stragglers and I know if I were flying around with Adam and Dottie and Laura looking at a spot in the chimney I think I'd wait until last two and pile on top of everybody I don't know Melanie, about... do you still have any or are we are you done is it done at your area I think Melanie has been we may uh, have lost Melanie so we have some more questions coming in so Stephen let's stick with your live view um have most of these birds been here for the season or have some just migrated in, Adam? I would bet the majority are just... Adam, you're on mute. Unmute. I got it now. Um, I would bet the vast majority of these birds are just transient migrating through. Um, we, we definitely probably have some that are still sticking around that have been nesting in the general area of, you know, Metro Atlanta and all the chimneys we have. But especially with such a large group and it getting... You know, it, it, around here in August, you can start to see some of this behavior, but it's kind of peaking right about now, you know, into September. So educated guests, it's a mix with a lot of migrating birds coming through. That's crazy that they, they, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm, I'm so amazed. I'm like a 12 year old out here and I, I'm sorry. I keep, I keep interrupting. Michelle, do you have any questions you coming in from Facebook? Uh, let's see, we've got one question asking if this is a nightly occurrence. It, it can be, but, but yeah, again, it can really kind of, you know, Laura, I think just a couple days ago had hundreds of thousands at her chimney and then they're just gone like that. So yes and no, it could happen on any night. And there are probably, you know, large, well-known spots, not well-known to the, to the birds, but large welcoming locations like Stevens where maybe it's more often than not. Um, so yeah, any night for the next, you know, three, four weeks, maybe, um, the sooner the better, I would go out and look for these types of chimneys and, or go down to uh, the, the belt line off Pond City Market and look at uh, the, the loft chimney that we're looking at right now in Stevens View. And for those that don't know, my, my chimney, so to speak, and Laura's chimney are less than a block apart. And uh, I live in the middle of them. So it's pretty amazing how they move around. And this that's showing now um, over the horns blowing behind me and the guy that just asked me for money um, is the video I recorded three days ago because mine have all gone into the chimney now. They just disappeared while Adam was talking. And Adam, we have another question that's come in from the Zoom meeting. Um, somebody says they know that bat towers need to be in open areas away from trees. Are there such specifications for swift towers? 
Yeah, uh, and it's similar. Um, in general, they don't need to be in a completely open, you know, patch of grass, but, you know, if you can get 20, 30 feet away from, from the trees, that's ideal, or at least that's what the uh, recommendations are for these man-made towers. I think the theory is not only will the birds have a better chance of finding the opening, but it will reduce the number of predators that could maybe jump from a canopy tree and get into the chimney and do harm to the birds when they're nesting or when they're roosting. So yeah, it, it doesn't need to be in the middle of an open grassy field, but a little bit away from the canopy trees is recommended. Um, and somebody wants to know what they sound like in person. Do they vocalize? They do, and unfortunately, whoever that is must have missed Melanie's earlier. We got a great, yeah. great audio clip of her birds. To me, they sound almost like a video game type, um, mechanical type, mm -hmm. high pitched. It's a real fast chatter. Um, and it's pretty distinct. Once you, once you know it, I think it'll stick with you. So you can go to um, the All About Birds webpage or to eBird, or if you just type in Chimney Swift, you know, Wikipedia probably has an audio recording as well. And it's a really cool sound. And again, they fly so high that almost every time I find a Chimney Swift, I hear it first, I look up, it takes me a second, and then you can fly them or find them flying around uh, in the sky. Um, do chimneys must have any predators? I would think yes, of course they do, but I'm trying to think what they would be. So of course in, 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 the, in the chimney, anything that could get in there could take them. So any sort of mammalian predator or even possibly a snake or something like that. In the air, there are probably a few but not many birds just because they're so fast and agile. One bird that comes to mind, which actually is not here in the U.S., but could get them when they're going down in migration would be the bat falcon. If you're ever lucky enough to go bird watching in Central America, there's a small falcon similar to a kestrel or a merlin. And, you know, referencing those, a merlin could probably take a, a swift. But those bat falcons are great at taking swifts and bats, of course, and other small flying things. So really quick falcons, I would think, are about the only birds that could catch them on the wing. And even that's probably a tough ask. So things that could find them on the nest or when they're sleeping, and then a very limited group of predatory birds are the only things that I could think of that might have a chance of catching them. And can you explain one more time how they hold on, how they cling to the sides of the chimney? Because you said they, I think you confused people when you said they have no feet. They do have. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> they, they, they do have feet. They have really, really stubby legs. So if you remember your taxonomy from biology class, you know, the kingdom and phylum and order and genus and all that stuff, they're in the order Apodiformes, which is the same as our hummingbirds. So think about how small those hummingbird legs are. Uh, swifts are just like that, little teeny legs with small feet that are held close to their, their chest. And because of the way that their feet and legs are positioned, they cannot perch on a branch like a cardinal would. And if you try to look up a photo of a chimney swift, you're either going to see them in flight or you're going to see the same exact photo on every web page because there just aren't photos of birds really perched because they can't, and that one is from a rehab bird, at least that's the story I've been told. So these birds, again, they're flying literally all day, eating, drinking, bathing, mating, whatever. Then when they come into the chimney, so what Steven's birds are doing right now is they're just holding on to the rough side, the brick or the textured wood or whatever it might be, they're clinging on. Um, at, imagine if your hands came out of your chest and you know that's what they're grabbing onto. But yeah, they can't perch. Like, like the songbirds do. So that's one way that they're different from swallows. So they look very similar to swallows, your barn swallow and your purple martin, but barn swallows and, and others are actually songbirds where swifts are not. They're just superficially similar, convergent evolution. They're both uh, evolved a way to go after those flying bugs. So they do have legs and feet, but they don't use them as you think most birds do. Hey, Adam, we've got some questions coming in on Facebook for you. So. Okay. Um, talk a little bit about, and maybe Steven or Laura, since they've got those nice views of the chimneys, how does it look in the morning when the swifts are coming back out of the chimney? Are they in big swarms like this, or do they come out a little bit more spaced out? I'll let one of the chimney hosts, if they want to. 
Um, well, I've, wa I've watched them a couple of times come out. Um, they, they come out around um, right before uh, dawn, and they come out in a different way. It's not a swarm. It's more in clumps. Um, four or five birds at a time will come out, and it, it seems to take a lot longer for them to come out than for them to, to go in. Um, so that's been my experience. It's, it's um, easier to count how many birds are in your chimney when you look at them coming out in the morning. Awesome. So Adam, tell us, how do they drink while flying? They come down and they'll skim the top of like a pond. Um, I'm sure they also get, you know, moisture from some of their food items and stuff. But yeah, I, I want to, on occasion, if you're at a pond and you have a bunch of swifts and swallows, they come down and will kind of hit the top of the water. Um, that's also how they kind of bathe as well. So if you're in the right spot looking, they will come down low enough and, and they'll, they'll touch a body of water. And one thing, How long do they stay in the chimneys? Normally, you mean, so they'll be in there all, all night. So now that Stevens birds are there, they'll probably start leaving right at daybreak. You know, first light, you'll have the first ones probably taking off. If they're, that's for a roosting bird. And they could stay in that chimney, to the best of my knowledge, one night or a handful of nights when they're migrating. So that's what's happening right now. During the breeding season, these birds come back to Atlanta in April. And they'll use that same chimney from April until, you know, early August. And that's when they're raising their young. Um, so they build the nest with broken off little twigs, which they do in flight. They'll break off small branches. Um, and they build it with their saliva, with the gland uh, underneath their tongue, and these broken off branches. And it's like a half moon-shaped nest. They'll build it, they lay their eggs. If I'm not mistaken, the incubation time on the eggs is around two to two and a half weeks, somewhere in that range. Then the young will fledge, they'll stay in the, the nest for a couple more weeks, and then, then the young birds will start to cling to the chimney. So we, uh, especially the past couple years, have gotten quite a few calls from people saying they've had young birds fall down through their damper. So if you happen to have birds in your chimney, try to keep your damper closed, um, at least until they're gone. They can be a bit noisy, um, but just think about how exciting it is that you have swifts in your chimney. And, and then they'll start flying and taking off. Um, so this time of year, these birds could be in the chimney for, you know, 10, 12 hours, and then they're going to move on, or it could be a couple evenings, and then during the summer, it's, it's months that they're using the same spot. So Adam, we're used to hearing about birds migrating at night, but if these guys are in the chimneys at night, are they migrating during the day? They are. They are diurnal migrants, um, which is kind of interesting because so are hummingbirds, and I don't know if that has to do with maybe just, yeah, that's an interesting, I don't know if it has to do with their genetic relatedness or not, but um, hummingbirds are also diurnal migrants. So many of our songbirds, which again, these are not songbirds, um, do migrate at night and this is peak time for them. So we are doing a lot with bird building collisions and a lot of those collisions, uh, part of the uh, equation with that is nocturnal lighting. But yeah, these birds, they fly during the day. You might have heard last year there was a bit of a story in Charlotte where a bunch of Swifts ran into the NASCAR Hall of Fame, which was an illuminated building. Uh, that was at night. And so that would have been abnormal because, again, these birds aren't flying at night. So something there probably either spooked them from their roost or maybe they were relying on a roosting site that was capped, you know, kind of later in the season. I don't know the, the specifics or if that was ever figured out, but it caused the Swifts to fly at night. They then found the illuminated building and they hit there. And many of the birds were not harmed from the initial collision, but they can't get off the ground and fly because again, their legs are so limited. So a lot of rehabbers and, and bird lovers were there to try to pick up injured or just stranded birds to help them out. But, but yeah, they migrate during the day um, and they're flying a couple hundred feet up in the air, um, if not higher as, the, as they go. Hey, Laura, unmute yourself and then answer this question. Somebody wants to know, what is the maximum number you've estimated coming out of your chimney in the morning? Um, a couple thousand. <laughs> it's been quite a few. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's, it, it, the numbers um, seem to shift throughout the spring to the fall from a couple hundred to a couple thousand by the time they leave. And can you all who are at the chimneys, can you each tell us kind of a good public viewing area where 
you know, in the next few days, next couple of weeks before all these birds move out of here, what's a good spot for people to go in a public location to see these birds? The, the Kroger parking lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you look at uh, the Ford factory. <laughs> tell you what, go to the belt line. Tell you what, um, the Kroger parking lot is, is well lit and safe and they have security guards. Say which, say which Kroger, Stephen. I'm sorry, Kroger say at 725 Ponce de Leon Avenue um, is pretty safe. And also the Beltline right in front of the entrance to Ponce City Market is the other side of this chimney. And you can see the chimney pretty clear from there as well. And I'm telling you, get out here now and see them because when the bugs go away and the temperatures cool down, the birds go away. So come on over here um, and you won't be sorry. I'm telling you, it's awesome, man. Yeah. We're going to be sharing a live broadcast. Um, Stephen Ramsden has a nonprofit called Sunlit Earth, and he's going to be um, interviewing our Project Safe Light Atlanta volunteer, Mary Kimberly, and we're going to be broadcasting that live, doing a watch party at 10 a.m. on Friday morning. So if you're able to watch that, watch it live, or you can always come back and watch it later on our Facebook page. And we may have a cameo or two from a special guest. <laughs> Great. I, I just want to point out Stephen's enthusiasm. This, you know, I'm lucky enough to travel and bird, and I've worked in, you know, bird related jobs for, you know, more than half my life now. And the, the swifts coming into roost is definitely one of the top two or three avian phenomenon that I've ever seen it, especially if you have something the size of what Laura can have and what Stephen has over there at the Ford Factory Lofts. It really is special. And, it, you know, there's still so many questions. If, if you're a bit of a mathematician, there's a really cool research paper that breaks down the movement of these birds as they're coming in. I, I tried to read it last year in preparation for one of these talks to sound like, a, like I knew what I was talking about. And it was pretty dense, but it was really cool. And the graphics are neat. Um, and when Stephen was talking about some birds coming and checking it out and then leaving, um, I had done some work with Purple Martins and they had a similar thing where, you know, a couple of scout males would come and look, but if there weren't enough birds there yet, they would turn back and fly to the marsh and eat. Then they'd come back. So I don't know the, you know, specifics of the flock behavior. And if there is a um, hierarchy in the chimney, I don't know if that is known, but there's some pretty interesting behavior you can watch and um, just get you know, the uh, art. The uh, art gallery that Laura owns, uh, that is actually a lot better view and a lot closer view when they're there because um, you can get right up underneath the chimney, basically. And I went over there several times. And now that I know the owner, I'm going to take more, more uh, liberties going over there. But um, it, they, uh, they may be there tomorrow night. Who knows? But uh, they, are def they were definitely here at Ford Factory Square Lofts tonight. And I'm going to quit sharing my screen. Everybody's seen enough of that. And uh, just tell you, um, if you're interested in this stuff, man, Georgia Audubon's the way to go. Dottie and Adam and uh, Michelle and Melanie taught me everything I know about this, uh, which ain't much. But uh, get involved, man. Go out and do something. Get your mind off all the crazy out there and go do something in nature, and you will not regret it. And Adam says enthusiasm. I am enthused, my man. <laughs> hey, Michelle, are there any more Facebook questions? No, just everyone is just astonished to see all of the, the footage and the live views. And so this has been awesome. I'm so glad that it worked out this year, even though we had to do it virtually. I know we all were a bit skunked last year when we, we tried to do a, our live event uh, in person. So this is awesome. I thought we were going to get skunked tonight, too, because there wasn't a single chimney swift over my house all day long. So I was already ready for disappointment. And then literally three minutes before the broadcast, the sky just filled up with the birds. It was amazing. And they started doing the tornado right away. So I was trying to get him to start the broadcast early. I was like, let's go, let's go, let's go. But uh, yeah, it's, it's an incredible sight. And I'll just give a plug. You know, Stephen was talking earlier. He, he's really involved at Clyde Shepherd Nature Center or Nature Preserve. Um, this is peak, peak, peak migration right now. The next couple of weeks um, into early October, you know, spring migration gets a lot of buzz, deservedly so, because you have all those beautiful, colorful warblers and birds are singing. But if you think about it, there are two, three, four times as many birds migrating right now. We have all these young birds. Yeah. Fall warblers aren't that hard. Get out there and learn them. Um, it's a great time. You know, we have amazing weather right now across Georgia. 
and uh, I just if can't I make people enough to get out this weekend and whenever they can and enjoy not only the Swifts, but there's just so much passing through right now. We had a American Bittern, Green Heron, Cape May Warbler, Tennessee Warbler, uh, Black Pole Warblers. Uh, I saw about 10 different species of warblers. And if I saw them, anybody can see them, okay? And that place is absolutely <laughs> on fire right now for birding. And so is probably every other place in town right now. Decatur Cemetery, Blue Heron Nature Preserve. This is the week, folks. Get out there. Yeah. Um, well, I guess we will we'll go ahead and wrap it up because it's dark and we can't see the Swifts anymore. Um, I didn't even really make any opening announcements because we were so busy, eager to get to the Swifts, but our Georgia Bird Fest has started and there's still some registrations, um, still some spaces open in some of our workshops and classes. We have a Birding 101 workshop. Um, so we have some really good stuff coming up even for beginning birders as well as some trips and some bird walks, all socially distant with masks, please. Um, so we encourage you to visit our website at georgiaaudubon.org to sign up. And as we always make a plug, if you're enjoying all this content that we're pushing out during this time, we encourage you to become a member or to make a donation. Um, we're excited to have everybody in the flock and we're looking forward to when this craziness ends and we can get back to doing in-person Swift Night Out. So we'll definitely plan a few of those. And a special thank you to Stephen and Laura Adams for taking time out of their busy evenings to um, show us the spe spectacular display um, both the, right at their houses, which just blows my mind. But um, thank you all for coming and have a great evening. Thanks, guys. Thank you.